But you open up the pomegranate and it's filled with all these amazing, shiny, bright, juicy seeds. And every one of those seeds has the potential to become something much bigger. You know, it might land on cement and disappear, but it might land in very, you know, very rich soil and take root in ways that we don't even know. And I think that when Pete talked about working locally as the most important part, being the seeds of that pomegranate, but understanding that globally, that's really what Westpac is all about. So I'm very grateful to be back at Westpac. It's a bit of coming home, I suppose. I never lived in Westchester, but I, when I lived in New York, I was up here all the time, and I always loved it. I love the river. Um, and I know this is the first Westpac meeting without Pete without all of us having Pete in our lives, so it's a hard one. And it's a hard one because I think we are facing, as a country, some of the most difficult challenges that we've faced in a really long time. It's not to say that the new wars that we are embarking on now are worse than earlier wars. Wars are wars. People get killed in huge numbers. Wars are the epitome of injustice. That's not something new and different. But I think that what we're looking at right now is that we are seeing a country that is controlled by a level of fear that maybe goes back to the Red Scare. You know, we were talking about that tonight. How many people under the age of 30 or 40 know the term Red Scare? How many people here under 30 have heard the term Red Scare? Because you guys are up at Connie Hope Arts Center. Sorry, cheating, cheating. <laughs> the reality is, an awful lot of young people don't even know what a red scare is, right? They've sort of not really grown up knowing what reds were, are. So, but I think that we're seeing a level of fear, fear of Ebola, fear of ISIS, fear of immigrants. You know, you, you've heard the one about the undocumented worker who is crossing the, the Rio Grande illegally on his way to join ISIS, and he's got Ebola. You know, this, is, this is the image that, that people are hearing. And, you know, it's kind of funny, but it's the demonization of ever-growing groups of people in our country, in the world, in our cities. It, it's shocking. It's not surprising given the trajectories that we've been on for, unfortunately, way too long. <coughs> Sorry, I'm dosing on cough drops here. But it's, it's shocking because every time we hear, once again, that this group is now what we must fear, when it's so irrational, two people in the United States have been have contracted Ebola. No one from ISIS is attacking us. No one from ISIS has any intention that we know of, according to our own military and intelligence agencies, have any particular threat to the United States. But you wouldn't know that to see the headlines, to hear the, 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 the feverish kind of discussion that's underway. The, uh, I don't know if it was Harper's or some, some magazine in the last day or two, did a, a little comparison that you have a better chance of being killed by falling furniture than you do to be killed by a terrorist. No, really. I mean, couches fall over, refrigerators fall over. God knows how, I don't know. But this is true because it's tiny numbers in this whole country of 300 million people. It's something like 17 every year get killed by a falling refrigerator, 15 get killed by terrorists. You know, we're not like giving up our kitchens. So it's, <laughs> this is really, it's a dangerous, dangerous, this is good. <laughs> this is really a dangerous moment because we don't have leaders that are out there saying, Okay, everybody, get a grip. Calm down. Everybody just take a breath. You know? We don't have that. 
We have people making excuses for this and that, blaming each other for this and that. And most of the things they're talking about in the blame game are true. If we didn't have a history of cutting back social funding, the CDC would have been in better shape to respond better to this crisis in West Africa, where it is a real crisis. But what we're seeing, and there was a fascinating piece, maybe we're, maybe we're turning the corner. Maybe that's beginning to happen. The New York Times, I guess it was today's, had these side-by-side uh, -side articles on the front page about the level of compassion with which Ebola uh, sufferers in Liberia are being dealt with in a country that has none of the resources that we have. And the absolute fear and hysteria and mean-spiritedness that has characterized our response, where we don't have any risk. So I think that as we look forward to the new wars that are underway, we can call it the third Iraq war, we can call it Guat 2.0. Guat was always my favorite, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, acronym, thank you. It's my favorite acronym. The Global War on Terror, Guat. Because it sounds so evil, right? You know, I mean, even ISIS, it sounds kind of cheerful. Like ice cubes. <laughs> but what really sounds kind of grotesque, which is as it should be. So we can call it Guat 2.0. Like the first and second war in Iraq, its origins from the US side have to do with issues of oil, have to do with issues of power, the expansion of the US military, the provision of US military bases, all of those factors that played into the first and especially the second war against Iraq are still the root of the war the third time around. The, the global war on terror is reaffirming the US drive towards empire. In an, in an era, in a, at a moment, when there are real limits on that drive towards empire. But despite the limits, we're not giving up empire. We're just trying to manipulate it in a way that takes into account the economic crisis, for one thing. The U.S. can't afford to do what it used to do. Couldn't afford it last war either, as we all recall. And we're still paying off that war, and will be for generations. Because that $3 trillion war was paid largely on a credit card. Mostly held by China, but that's not particularly relevant to that. What is relevant is that we're leaving our children and grandchildren and great-great-great-grandchildren a legacy of debt that is going to prevent this country from, from having a population that is healthy and unified in any serious way in a, a very crisis mode. Now, these crises are, are emerging all around the world. We have the crisis in Ukraine, there's crises in Africa, there's crises across the Middle East. <clears throat> but in this country, the combination of the immediate crises of Ebola and ISIS <coughs> are combined with the economic crisis that has everybody in the country, except for the one-tenth of one percent, on edge for all the right reasons. Because none of us know if our economy is going to collapse, if we're going to lose our jobs, if we're going to, I mean, I've got to say, as an anti-war activist, I probably will never be out of work in my life. <laughs> On the other hand, it doesn't pay so well, so <laughs> you do the math. But it's, it's a moment, it's a moment when the realities of the economy are emerging everywhere we look. Yesterday's New York Times in the business section, which I pretty much never read, there was this amazing, I don't know why I picked it up, but there was a, an article that was reporting on a, a speech by Janet Yellen, the head of the Fed, the Federal Reserve. Now, I barely understand what the Fed does. But nonetheless, I thought, I should read this. She's an important person, I should read this. And there was one statistic that just jumped out at me and grabbed me by the throat. It wasn't something new, and my colleagues at IPS deal with this stuff all the time, and I read their reports, so it's not like I didn't know this, but somehow seeing it on the front page of the business section of the New York Times got to me in a whole different way. And that was, the first part, not so surprising. 
that the percentage of wealth in this country held by the bottom 50% has declined between 1999 and 2014, 13. That's not a surprise. Pretty much everybody's wealth, income, everything has gone down. But in this case, the wealth of the 50% had gone down from 3% to 1%. So that today, 50% of the people of our country, our 300 plus million people, 50% of it has access only to 1% of the wealth of this extraordinary wealthy country. What does that say about people's lives, about stability in our country, about justice, about how we fight against wars in the midst of such grave injustice? So I found that just a, a shocking thing to see. So all of that is the context in which we look at, so what in the world is this stuff going on in the Middle East? How can we possibly get our heads around all this? So we have a regional context of what was once at a, at a more hopeful moment four years ago and three years ago called the Arab Spring, the Arab Uprising, which I've got to say, I am not giving up on it. As bad as the conditions are in Egypt, for example, as bad as the human rights situation is in Egypt, I think that the Egyptian people are going to reclaim their revolutionary process. They're going to go back into Tahrir Square. They're going to get rid of the military rule at some point. But at what cost and how long is it going to take? And for how long is our country going to provide the military with their weapons? That's what we're, we're facing. In Libya, people rose up against a terrible, crazy dictatorship. But what did they get? They asked for US and NATO intervention, and it's that old story, be careful what you ask for. They got it, and look what they've got. A country in complete chaos, a government that is completely non-functional and virtually non-existent. <coughs> and the spread of weapons, not only throughout the country, making everyone in Libya at great risk, but throughout the region. Half of these weapons that people are capturing on the battlefield in Syria, in Iraq, have come from Libya. In Mali, they're everywhere. Because what happens when you have this giant bombing campaign that destroys the government that exists, as problematic as it was, you have nothing. You have no control. And what happens? People throw open the storehouses where the weapons are stored. And suddenly those weapons are everywhere. And we, as a world, as a people, as as humanity, are paying an enormous price for that. I think it's still possible, but it's going to take time, and it's not going to be easy. Palestine remains under occupation and apartheid. That hasn't changed. 23 years of failed diplomacy, occupation and apartheid still controls how people in Palestine live. But I think that's going to change. The rise of civil society-led initiatives like the boycott, divestment, sanctions issue uh, campaign and others are challenging the very essence of those policies, challenging U.S. support for the Israeli military. So what's different this time around? All those things haven't changed. So what's different in these new wars? One big difference, and again, it's not much of a difference for people on the ground where those wars are being fought, but when we try to be rigorous and ruthlessly sharp in understanding what is the political moment in which we find ourselves, we have to be very clear that this is a very different political moment in this country as those wars continue to be fought. One big difference is that Barack Obama is not the cheerleader for war that George Bush was. He is going along. Doesn't, as I said, change the situation on the ground. People are just as dead, and there are more of them right now. There are more countries that are facing drone attacks and bombings than there were before. But it is different for us when we figure out how to fight against it. It matters that the White House is led by somebody who's not the eager cheerleader for war, but the reluctant warrior who feels like he doesn't have any choice. Maybe a coward, unwilling to stand up to those pressures, 
I'm, I'm not going to second guess the psychology. I don't think it matters very much. But it does matter that that's not where the pressure starts. So we need to understand that. The neocons that were at the core of the cheerleading for war the last time around, they're still out there, they're still cheering, they're still getting their seats on television, but they're not in the White House, they're not mostly in the Pentagon. A couple of them have snuck back into the State Department, but they're mostly not in power. They're mostly back in their think tanks, the other think tanks. You know, it was, it was the, the, um, the great statement about IPS years ago from, from I.F. Stone, who said the, the, the liberals and the centrists have Brookings, the right wing has the Heritage Foundation, IPS is the think tank for the rest of us. <laughs> we always claim that. That's our, that's our but I think that the rationales for the war have not changed, ultimately. As I said before, this is about oil, this is about power, this is about the expansion of U.S. access to military bases, this is about sea lanes, it's about all those same strategic interests that were at the root of the, the Gulf War of 1991 and the Iraq War of 2003. But it's different. The situation with oil is very different because while we have, it turns out that the idea of peak oil wasn't quite right because there's still plenty of oil left, but what we have now used up is the easy oil. Now we're going after the hard oil in places like the Arctic and drilling in the ocean and fracking all the things that are the most damaging to the environment, to our planet. So we're still going after oil, but it's harder now. It's also different now because the U.S., since 2010, has been importing more oil from Africa than from the entire Middle East. So while we're still very eager to control the oil, control the contracts, control the pipelines, we are less interested than ever in our own access to it. It's not that important. So that changes how the oil equation works. It doesn't take away oil as a factor, but it means we have to understand it differently. The notion that we hear constantly about no boots on the ground matters and doesn't. There are already boots on the ground. A lot of them are probably not boots, they're sneakers because they're special forces. But, you know, they're shoes. They're not called barefoot. They're shoes on the ground. But there is a big difference between about 1,600 pairs of shoes on the ground in Iraq that we know about and probably 500 to 1,000 or so more that we don't know about between that and having 160,000 pairs of boots on the ground at one time. That's very different. Again, it doesn't mean that people in Iraq are not being killed by a US-funded, US-supported war. But how we fight it is different. If there are thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of US troops on the ground, versus if they're not. This time around, there are not. Now, that may change. But right now, it doesn't seem that that's the trajectory they're moving in. The boots on the ground, they want to be Arab boots from the US-backed monarchies, the petro-states. Saudi boots are OK. Qatari boots are OK. Turkish boots, we like Turkish boots. We want Turks on the ground. We just don't want US people with their boots on the ground. So the politics of it is different. Obama gets blamed for the chaos in Iraq on the basis that he pulled out the troops. Oh, really? You're going to claim that that's what caused the problem? Not the sending the troops there? <laughs> but that's what they're dealing with. He's reshaping the war so he can say, this isn't going to be a US war. We're not sending troops on the ground. I mean, yeah, there's a few troops on the ground, but they're not combat troops. Oh, okay. Are they armed? Well, yeah, of course they're armed. And if they get shot at, what are they ordered to do? Well, they fight back, of course, but they're not combat troops. Oh, okay. They're something else. But it's different. You know, right now we're seeing mostly the fear factor is focused on Ebola more than on ISIS. But that's perhaps changing, partly because I think some, even in the mainstream press, who have been so responsible for the hysteria of Ebola, are starting to think that maybe they went a little too far, and maybe they need to calm everybody down just a little bit. But I, it's also true that one more beheading by ISIS 
could completely reverse that situation as well. And we need to be clear, I'm going to talk about ISIS in a minute, but just on the question of the beheadings, which is what transformed the public understanding in this country of what we are facing in the Middle East. These beheadings are horrific. They are absolutely horrifying. And the idea that they are carried out so up close and personal makes them particularly horrific, especially when they're in our face on the internet. Now, I'm assuming that most people in this room did not actually watch the videos. I don't know anybody who actually watched the whole video to see it. But even what we saw in our face in the news or whatever is horrifying enough. What we don't see is the impact of US dropped cluster bombs in Iraq. What we don't see close up is the impact of Israeli dropped white phosphorus on children in Gaza. It is horrific. And when we only see one example, close up and personal and horrifying, it's not surprising that for lots of people, that starts to be defined as that's the worst thing in history. That's the frighteningest thing we've ever faced. Instead of saying, geez, this is horrifying. It's just as horrifying as all the killing that our soldiers are doing. There's also an interesting thing. I know a lot of people in, how many of you work on death penalty issues? A few, okay. Webpack has a long history, as you know, on the death penalty. And there's an important point here. I was talking about this the other day with somebody, and I hadn't really thought about this, but when he said it, I thought, oh my god, that's exactly right. You know, the, the statistics on the death penalty and how it's racialized is an old story. But what's not usually understood is that it's a much more subtle racism that's underway beyond the idea that black people charged with murder are more likely to get the death penalty. That's true. But it's not the biggest factor. The biggest factor is not the race of the perpetrator, guilty or not guilty. The biggest factor is the race of the victim. If somebody kills a white man, she or he is much more likely to get the death penalty, whether she or he is black, white, Latino, or anything else, than if the victim is not a white man. So the power of the killing, this up close and personal and incredibly gruesome killing, of two white American men goes directly to that same kind of racism in this country that determines who gets the death penalty. Who, whose death at the hands of some vicious guy with a knife, whose death becomes serious enough to make us willing to go to war all over again, a week after our, our public opinion polls said that 70% of Americans said we don't want war. If the two people, the two Americans who had been killed were African American women, I don't think we would have had the same result. I don't know, and I hope that we never have the polling data to find out, but I think it's something that has to give us pause, something that we have to confront as we look at how do we fight back, how do we respond. Because one of the problems that we have is that just like we faced after 9-11, where all of you are close enough to New York that you saw this, this was not a situation where we had real leaders who said, we have been attacked in the most horrific way, with almost 3,000 civilians killed in one horrifying attack. And we are going to respond to that horrifying crime with international law and cooperation with police forces all around the world. No. We heard, there's a choice. We either go to war, or we let them get away with it. There was no other option. And given that choice, why are we not surprised that 88% of Americans said, we're going to war? Because the option was only, let them get away with it. And who's prepared to let them get away with it? We are still facing that situation now. When we hear over and over again, we can't let them get away with it. That's a perfectly reasonable emotional reaction. It's not a strategy. 
it's not an answer to what do we do about it? What do we do that will prevent it from ever happening again? So what we're told is we either go to war, in this case against ISIS, or we're letting them get away with it. And since no one wants them to get away with it, we go to war. So I'll get to what, what would it look like to do something that wasn't war. But I want to talk for a minute about ISIS, because that's also an arena where we're hearing a lot of stuff that isn't all necessarily true. What a surprise we hear stuff in the mainstream media that's not true. <laughs> what a surprise. We heard from John Kerry. How many of you saw the, the um, TV coverage of that congressional hearing that our <coughs> friends at Code Pink, Medea, the others, disrupted uh, where, where um, Kerry was, was uh, about to testify? And they were in there, as always, in the back of the room. How they let them in, I still don't know. <laughs> they have like a card. Don't let her in, don't let her in. <laughs> there they were, in their code pink t-shirts. You know, calling out, American people do not want war. It was very, it was very powerful. And when John Kerry took his seat after they, you know, dragged Medea out kicking screaming, he took his seat and he said, you know, I know the women who created that anti-war organization. And he named Code Pink. It was, it was really quite impressive. He said, and I know that what they have fought for is not only to prevent war, but that the money that goes to pay for war should instead be used for health care and education. And I can tell you, he said, with his finger just like this, I can tell you that ISIS is not providing health care or education for anybody. <laughs> and I had my little checklist and I said, okay, lie number one. <laughs> now the reality is that ISIS is a horrific, violent, extremist organization that has been responsible for killing, we think, as many as several thousand people. It may not be that many, but it appears almost that many. It is also true that in the areas they have controlled for long periods of time, which includes uh, Fallujah, for example, includes for more than a year parts of, of Syria, they have created schools, systems, clinics. Now, is it a school I would want children to go to? No. But they are running a society. They are building clinics. They are urging teachers to come back and teach. And yes, they are punishing people who don't teach the way they want to. That's all true. But to say that they are not doing something is very different than to say they are doing things in a way that we find reprehensible. So we, we have to understand that part of it. Now the origins of ISIS, like the origins of so many Islamist extremist organizations these days, and I use that phrase these days because I think it is important to recognize that particularly in the Middle East, although not only, we're looking at a reality that faces the failure of Arab socialism, the failure of Arab nationalism, the failure of pan-Arabism, the failure of right-wing Arab governments who try to link to the global economy, the failure for people in these countries to have a better life. A better life economically, a, a freer life politically. None of those things happened. All of those earlier ideological frames failed. And those ideological frames were the way that people fought back against colonialism, against neocolonialism, against imperialism, against foreign intervention. Didn't work. And now, for many people, the fight back against foreign intervention and foreign interference and repressive regimes takes an Islamist do I like it? No. I'm a pretty secular girl. I don't want to live under any kind of religion. But I don't live there. You know, I don't get to choose. And I think it's also true that while we do have an obligation to be consistent in our understandings of human rights, international law, equality for all, it means we don't, we have no obligation to accept as legitimate some political force uh, who does not support equality, does, you know, none of those things, because they are also somehow against foreign intervention. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that this is a moment when 
opposition to imperialism, opposition to colonialism, opposition to foreign intervention, is taking an Islamist form. And some of it is pretty awful. But we don't get to choose what movements exist in the world in which we live. We get to choose the movements we build. We don't get to choose everybody else's movements. So it doesn't help us to simply dismiss them as only about their violence and their extremism. That does put them, in my view, outside the pale of any kind of organization we would ever deem legitimate. And it means, in my view, we need to support those who are fighting against them. But if we're serious, it also means we have to understand their origins. So their origins are under occupation. Their origins were in the early 2003 to 2006 period in Iraq, during the period of the US invasion and occupation of Iraq. They used to be called something else. They were called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. <laughs> then they were part of Al-Qaeda. They were the, the Iraqi branch of Al-Qaeda. And there were all kinds of power struggles. You know, these organizations are not immune from the same struggles over money and territory and power and whatever that politicians of all sorts fall victim to. So they had fights. And the Al-Qaeda people basically kicked them out of the franchise. At one point saying they were too violent. At other points they said other things. There was a, 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 a theological difference between them. You know, Al-Qaeda also wants to build a caliphate. But the, uh, the guys that are now ISIS, they just declared one. And Al-Qaeda said, no, you can't do that. And they said, yeah, we can. And so that's part of the, the fight as well. It's an internal whatever, whatever we think of it, that's a big part of the divide between Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Which also, among other things, we should just be clear that the fact that Al-Qaeda at some point said they're too violent is not a statement that Al-Qaeda is not violent. But, I mean, just to be very clear. Um, so, there's a whole history there. They get expelled from the Al-Qaeda franchise. They get sort of weakened by the time of the so-called surge in Iraq where the U.S. paid off Sunni uh, militias of various sorts, tribal-based militias, uh, to fight against Shia militias instead of fighting against the American occupation. So that's what went on for a while, and under that, those conditions, they kind of faded away. But they were never, they never completely collapsed, they never were completely gone. They then resurfaced in Syria. They had moved across the border and resurfaced in Syria in the first year or so of the civil war in Syria. And suddenly they had a new name. First it was the uh, ISIS, then it was ISIL, then it was IS. So, you know, it has lots of different versions. I gotta say, I don't quite get why <coughs> President Obama insists on the ISIL one. He's almost the only one that's using it anymore. And the problem I have with it is not, I mean, at one level, I really could care less what they call it. But the significance of that one is that ISIL uses the term Levant. It's the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. Levant was the, er, the French colonial term for what was known as Greater Syria, right? Why would you want to use the French colonial term? You know, it's, it's like when Bush said the thing about a crusade, that this is our crusade. It's like, really, you want to say that? <laughs> so when you're trying to win hearts and minds, what do you think? <laughs> but anyway, so, they, they reemerge with this new theology. They're going to cre create this caliphate essentially by announcing it and announcing that their guy, El Baghdadi, is the head of this caliphate. And that all Muslims now need to pledge their fealty. And what starts to happen is that in Syria, a lot of the Islamist forces that were fighting sort of each other and sort of against the regime in Syria start to think, you know, these guys seem to be doing better than we are. They seem to have better weapons, they seem to have better training. Let's join them. It's always good to be on the winning side. So they start to pull in recruits. And what's important to understand is that this is not because of their level of violence. I mean, it may be in some cases it is. But the widespread support that they have gained in, in Syria and even more in Iraq is not because of the violence, it's despite the violence. So if you look at Iraq, why would ordinary Iraqi Sunnis support an organization like this? Iraqi Sunnis tend to be a pretty secular bunch, 
right? They drink, they smoke. You know, this is not where religious extremism is, is strongest in Iraq. So why would they hook up with these guys? Well, the reason is that the so-called government that the U.S. installed and is continuing to pay and arm and train in Iraq has been so brutally sectarian against ordinary Sunnis that they are prepared to say, you know what, we'd rather deal with these guys than those people in Baghdad. Because the people in Baghdad are the ones who have been dropping barrel bombs. You know, we've heard a lot about barrel bombs and how horrifying they are, and they are. But we hear about it <coughs> only when they're dropped by the regime in Syria. We don't hear about it except buried on page, you know, A17, paragraph 30 in the New York Times. We don't hear about it when they're dropped by the government in Iraq or by the, the Shia militias aligned to the government in Iraq. But that's what they've been doing. They've been arresting people, torturing people in prisons, summary executions, bombing uh, Sunni villages and towns. So you had the new prime minister when he was elected, and that was an important step to choose a new prime minister and get rid of Maliki. That's true. But boy, is it not enough yet. So he makes a, a speech in which he says, we will no longer bomb Sunni towns. Oh, well, good. But really, are you admitting that you were? Because up until then, they hadn't been admitting it. They were saying, oh, this is being done by the, the Shia militias. This isn't us. This isn't the government. So this is a serious, this is a serious problem. And like other Islamist organizations that are not so extreme, but are still viewed as terrorists by the US and others, like Hamas, like Hezbollah, who all emerged under occupation, all emerged to fight occupation, they changed when they gained a certain amount of power. The difference is Hamas and Hezbollah both became far more pragmatic as they gained more power. They ran in elections. They won in elections. ISIS has sort of had the opposite. As they've gained more power, they've become more extreme. So it's worse than ever. So this is a very bad, <clears throat> very dangerous um, moment as they are controlling more territory, ruling over more people, they are becoming more violent, more extreme in their ideology. And they are continuing to get a lot of support in Iraq from three sources. So you have the tribal leaders and their militias, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. They are getting military support, training, training very crucially, and military strategy from whom? From former generals, from Saddam Hussein's old military, who were thrown out of the military on the first day of the U.S. occupation. Remember the first thing the U.S. did when they went in and overthrew the government was to dismantle the army. That's real smart, right? You, you take 400,000 people, men, 400,000 men with their arms and throw them out of work. That's real smart, right? So it led, not surprisingly, to huge levels of opposition to the government, the, the new Shia-dominated government in Iraq. <laughs> And you have the situation where these guys have gone home to their, their original villages or wherever, and they are pissed. They are really, really pissed. And now, years later, all of a sudden, they have a chance to act on it. They've got some other force, this, this Sunni group of, of thugs, these, these extremists, who need some good military training. It's like, we're all over. We're here. That's why, they have, why, why they're winning. That's why they're, they're doing well militarily. And the third is the ordinary Sunnis that I told you about. Not all of them, thankfully, but enough that it's giving support to ISIS because they are seen as the lesser evil. Violent as they are, they are the lesser evil. So that's a huge challenge that we're facing right now because this new government is not doing so well. You know, it's, it's better than it was in the sense that there's some, some good rhetoric about being more inclusive and all of that. But, you know, they finally, it took them three months, they finally, just two days ago, were able to decide on a Minister of, of Intelligence and a Minister of Defense. But so what did they do? They, they said, well, we're going to have one Sunni and one Shia, that's all fine. But the Shia guy is the former leader of the Badr Brigade, which was one of the most violent of the sectarian Shia brigades. And the Sunni guy has virtually no support from anybody, except he happens to be a Sunni. So it's kind of a mess. They haven't really gotten that down. Now, I, I, I know we're getting late, and you guys have been here for a long time working, so I'm going to try and make this um, 
a little shorter. Um, the region is facing a huge crisis, and it's centered very much in Syria. There are now, by my count, seven separate wars being waged in Syria, and every one is being fought to the last Syrian. Now, it doesn't mean that it's seven different sets of people. It's a lot of the same overlapping sets of fighters. But there are at least seven sets of interests that are at stake. So you have the original fight between a large part of the population, not all of it, but a large part of the population versus the government. That's war number one. You have a regional war for power, largely between Iran and its allies and Saudi Arabia and its allies. You have a war of sorts between the US and Israel on the one side and Iran on the other side over nuclear policy. You have a US-Russian global war, luckily mostly a war of words so far, that has to do with uh, uh, military bases and, and uh, sea lanes and a host of other broad global strategic interests. You have a regional sectarian fight between Sunni and Shia. You have a secular versus sectarian battle within Syria between the secular forces and the Islamist forces within the resistance to the regime. And now you have the last, the seventh, I, I did this article about the five wars of Syria, and then I had to change it to the six wars of Syria. <laughs> well now it's the seven because now we have a war within the Islamist opposition between ISIS and all the others. So as you can see, there's a lot of overlap in like who's actually out there fighting and crucially, who's dying. Who's dying are ordinary Syrians, most of whom are not fighters, but they are dying nonetheless. So that's the problem in the region, and it's a, it's a mammoth one. So how, how do we respond? What do we do? That's the last part of the most important before we open up for questions. We have to start by challenging this equation between or, the, or the, the, the question between you either go to war or you let them get away with it. That there are options. There are alternatives. So that's the first thing. To get people to understand and to force our politicians to acknowledge that there are alternatives. You know, when we, we hear some of these alternatives sometimes from the State Department, from the White House, never from Congress. But, you know, you do hear it from official Washington, but it's always in the context of, the military isn't the only thing we're doing. Oh, by the way, we're also doing a little bit of ABC over here. The problem is everything they do militarily is undermining the ABC. So every time the US bombs ISIS in Iraq and says, hey, great, we got the bad guys, what Iraqi Sunnis see is the US is bombing in the interest of the Kurds and the Shia against us. So we better stick with ISIS because we got nobody else. So we have to see things from the vantage point of people on the ground, and not only from the vantage point of our own leaders, such as they are. So what are our demands? What do we do? I think we start with hypocrisy, except his real name was Hippocrates. You start with first do no harm, the Hippocratic oath that doctors take. It should be an oath for every, everyone in every, you know, Every every position first. It means first, don't bomb. First, but that's only first. It, our critics who say, "Oh, you people just want to do nothing." No, but we want first to not bomb. Then, what do we want? Then we want a ceasefire. Now, that's not going to happen over. How are we going to get there? We start by demanding it. We start by calling for it. We start by saying, we know if we're talking about Syria, that there's not going to be, we, can, we have no basis, our government has no credibility, no, no legitimacy to call on Russia and Iran, the main uh, funders and armors, is that the right word? Those who arm the regime in Syria to stop arming that regime as long as the US and its allies are arming everybody else. So we say, we need a ceasefire on all sides. Step one, 
the U.S. says we are going to stop sending any arms to anybody. And we are going to prevent our friends in the region from sending, it's all our arms anyway, that $60 billion arms deal that the Saudis signed with the U.S. two years ago. Guess where that's all going? But we're going to say, we're going to stop our friends from sending arms to these various rebel forces that are destabilizing the whole region and ending up in the hands of ISIS. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, that's the hard one. That's the one that requires a willingness in Washington to stand up to who? Not the public, the arms industry. That's never an easy trick. But that's what we have to be demanding. The only ones who are doing well are those who are making a killing on this war. So that's where we have to start. We need a ceasefire, and we need it now. And we will start it, and then we will demand of Russia and Iran that they stop funding the, those, I mean, arming those that they are arming as well. Then, we need a ceasefire locally. We need many ceasefires locally. There was an extraordinary group of Syrian women who just issued a public call for what it will take to end the war. And they were very clear. They said, we need three things. I was very happy that they were all within my list. I had five, they had three, but that's okay. They said, we don't need bombs, we don't need weapons. We need first, more humanitarian support. Secondly, we need local ceasefires. And third, we need new negotiations. So that's next on my list too. The, the, local, the local ceasefires can be absolutely crucial in saving lives. You know, you have in many cities in, in Syria right now, not so much in Iraq, but in Syria there are areas where the two sides, the government and the opposition, at the local level, have come together and said, this is nuts. We don't need to be killing each other. Let's declare a ceasefire here, let's figure out a power sharing arrangement here. And suddenly there's a corridor to get food into an area that had been besieged. Suddenly there's a way to get ambulances in to get people out, to get medical care, who were at risk of dying for lack of it. So then we have these local ceasefires. Now we need new negotiations. Now the negotiations collapsed a year and a half ago. But that doesn't mean you just give up. It means you have to start again. And the negotiations have to be very broad. And the US has to get over this idea that they get to veto who's participating. Because if they're going to say, like they did the last time, Iran can't come, you want to talk about a guarantee of failure? Not just a likelihood of failure? That's your best shot. Don't let the Iranians in the door. Oh, okay. So everybody who Iran speaks for is already feeling dispossessed. And the Iranians are, have a free pass to violate it with impunity because, hey, they didn't sign on. We weren't at the table. We're not bound by this. So first thing, everybody's at the table. Then you have side negotiations. The US has to negotiate directly with Russia over the question of who's arming who in Syria and how do we stop it. The U.S. has to negotiate directly with Iran over who are we funding in Baghdad and how do we get these guys under control. Because you know what? Right now, despite the fact that it's our tax billions that are propping up the government in Iraq, the U.S. has far less influence in Baghdad than Iran does. So if the U.S. isn't completely crazy, which I grant may well be, they really need to be talking to Iran. So we need that real diplomacy. Then, as the Iraqi women, the Syrian women said, we need massive increases in humanitarian assistance. Now, the US has given more than anybody else, but it is a pittance relative to our responsibility for the instability in that region, and it's a pittance given our, our economic might in the world. So we owe a huge debt to the people of Syria, the people of Iran, the people of Iraq, all of these countries. And we need to make it real. We need to, we need to stop the situation that exists now, where just a few weeks ago the UN had to cut back on its food rations for the several million refugees and internally displaced people in Syria. They had to cut the food rations by 40% because the money pledged has not come in, including some from the United States. Longer term, we need to start now talking about what happens when we have weapons of mass destruction and why do we need a weapons of mass destruction free zone throughout the Middle East. 
And that means, yeah, that means we don't want any potential Iranian nuclear weapon. But let's start with the nuclear weapons that do exist, that are not Iranian, but are Israeli. And let's get rid of them, because they are destabilizing the whole region. So that's another long-term goal that we have to have on the agenda. We have to look at climate. You know, if you want to trace the origins of the crisis in Syria, it goes back to climate. A three-year drought between 2007 and 2010 that threw enormous, thousands and thousands, enormous numbers, thousands of farmers off their land. They couldn't live anymore. They flood the cities looking for work, and there's practically no jobs. So when you have a situation like that where you suddenly have tons of people flooding into the cities, <coughs> all looking for the same tiny few numbers of jobs. Who gets those jobs? The people who know someone in power. That tends to be Alawites, because they've been the most powerful in Syria, even though Syria was never particularly sectarian in terms of its practice. But suddenly, it's looking pretty damn sectarian, because the people getting the jobs are the people who knew somebody in power. And the people who aren't getting the jobs are the ones who are not the Alawites. So it goes back directly to the question of climate change. So when we start thinking about our climate justice movement globally, it's not separate from ending the wars in the Middle East. And finally, how do we do the education? Well, our friends at the National Priorities Project, thank God, are bringing back our great cheat sheets of the cost to every state, every city. You know, you, you guys are, are familiar with their work. It's fantastic. And they took down their cheat sheets last year. I was completely freaked out. It's like, I told them, this is what I do every day when I go speak somewhere. The last thing I do before I leave the house is print out whatever it is. I couldn't do Westchester today. I was devastated. No, say again for me, because I don't National Priorities Project. NPP, no, nationalpriorities.org. They're putting them back up. I don't think they're up yet, but their cost of war statistics are among the best around. We have to educate people about the cost of war, the human cost of war, the financial cost of war, the moral cost of war, the cost to international law, the cost to our own security. Because you know what real security means in this country? Is not how big the Pentagon is. That's what puts us at greater risk. We need human security, not military security. So we have to be talking with people about what that means and how it will look. We have to mobilize on this question of alternatives to war, not just adding something. Say, well, the war is the first step, but it's an emergency. So we have to have war, and then we'll work on the others. Because you know what? Once we send the troops, we don't ever work on the others. So we have to come away from the idea that the war is the first step and the other comes later to say, no, we need alternatives to war. We need something else right from the beginning. I, I got a call tonight about doing a uh, a radio, a TV show, and this is Al Jazeera, you know, who has a somewhat more nuanced view of some of this stuff. And she said, you know, we're trying to get somebody who, who would be opposed to militarization of the crisis right now on the Turkish border. And I said, well, I'm traveling, I, I can't do it. She said, well, do you have anybody else? We you can't find anybody. It's a really unpopular view. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, if the producers at Al Jazeera are finding it unpopular, we're in serious trouble here. This means a big job for Westpac. This is a really good job. This is a really good job. We can't let Congress off the hook. Election or no election, we've got to hold them accountable for this stuff. Bird dogging, there's still another, what, two weeks, three weeks before the election? We've got to be bird dogging them on this stuff. Where do you stand on arming the Syrian so called moderate rebels? Where do you think those guns are going to end up? You know, ask them that. Get them on the record. So that's, that's our job, and it's a really hard one. I don't know that we've ever faced a harder time to take up the tasks that Westpac was created to take up, to fight against war, to fight for justice, and to do it in a way that takes into account the political realities of racism and class oppression in this country. It's something Westpac has led around for 40 years is it now? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. You all have an incredible history. But boy, we have a lot of work to do. Thank you.